Welcome, one and all, to the opening of Civ Battle Royale X Season 3. I am Doc Ito, and you're not. For our first episode, Koyat will be your narrator. Conquest, bloodshed, and Berea's excellent cartography await, so without further ado, let's dive right in. Welcome back, everyone. I'm happy to introduce Seabrix Season 3. We were not quite able to achieve the seamless transition between seasons as we did with the previous two cycles, but a four-month gap is still a record, and in truth, the recording itself was much less. At the moment, the game still does not have a winner, but it is beyond turn 700, and the roster is looking rather slim. Thanks to much hard work, we've ensured that this time around there are no embarrassing bugs hidden about, and thanks to a few modifications, we are seeing no overflowing peacekeepers whatsoever, so there is a likely chance we'll have the full map in one color without resetting the game. The newly expanded PR team has been hard at work in the days preceding this episode, and when the dust settled, Rio de la Plata is the competitor tipped to perform the best this season. Now it is of course far too early for certainty, but you have several sieves in the top 10 spots that occupy your usual geographically favored locations. Time will tell which meet expectations, which will flop, and which will make you smile far into the future. Thank you once again to donators who kept up their pledges throughout the summer break. It is a great help to keep the website running, and there are bonuses for even one-time donators to the show. If you've got an extra dollar lying around, we could really use it. Here we are, sub, waiting on board, ready for the slow grind toward global domination. We'll be sitting here up all cozy, hidden in the ice, as we watch the madness unfold. On to the show proper. We begin, as usual, on the leftmost side of the map with Ireland, the Anglo-Dutch, the Anglo-Norse, and Brandenburg. The sparsely populated isles are contrasted with the immediately bunched up group of competitors on the continent. Brandenburg starts the game already being a fan favorite, whilst the other three feel the weight of that forecast with downcast initial ranks. Just south are Castile, the Normans, and Tetuan. If this part of the Mediterranean feels rather empty, you would be correct, as much of the coastline is up for grabs, and an empty France also means that Castile has a safe little nook already in place. Further into Europe are Lithuania, Yugoslavia, Kievan Rus, and Vladimir, a motley crew of unlikely faces who will be at each other's throats in the usually cramped region. Rounding out Europe is Khazaria as the sole Jewish representative this season. Across the Urals into Asia are the Permians, who undoubtedly have the largest open tracts of land available to them. Below are Turkey and Assyria. Assyria is currently being carried by their launch of their ASS stock, currently memed to high heaven, but underneath the hype is still quite a worthy contender. Turkey is a bit of a wild card, but the aforementioned open Mediterranean gives them an opportunity to exploit if their immediate neighbors become too much of a bother. All of West Africa is Mali's for the taking. Competitors in this region are known for nose-diving fortunes, so while the number of empty tiles on screen seems appetizing, we'll watch this space with caution. Eastward lie Chad, Egypt, Yemen, and Uganda. Pre-gigaform Chad has strong hopes behind them, but if you know the way, perhaps another one amongst these will be the African regional power. Southern Africa is a crowded affair. Angola, Botswana, Kilwa, and Zulu begin in close proximity. Kilwa is a big unknown that has shown to be one of the most interesting sibs to include in an AI game, and having a purple color scheme attracts attention. It's open for any of these four to come out on top though, so expect predictions amongst them to fluctuate. Jumping to Central Asia, we have the Masagete. Like most steppe competitors, they are expected to get big and start pillaging their neighbors. We hope that means they can keep the Permians in check for the first few hundred turns. Below is Afghanistan, making its return to the show. Afghanistan has the cozy mountainous landscape all to themselves, so unlike before, they are a safe bet to challenge outside the region, or at least be a long-time turtle. On the other side of the steppes are Tuva, the Gokturks, and Kolcho. Tuva and the Gokturks are destined to be immediate rivals. If you're looking for competitors with high potential, I would pick one of these two to go the distance. Kocho, on the other hand, has a different outlook. 
With an unenviable starting location between potential juggernauts, Kocho has to make big plays happen fast to remain in contention beyond a few episodes. Even further east are North Korea, the Ainu, and Mori. North Korea returns to the show courtesy of the Lurker vote, while the relatively obscure Mori were voted in with a highly effective and vocal campaign. The Ainu, usual runner-up of previous voting terms, squeeze in, hoping to look up to the Chukchi for a blueprint for similar success. China will be represented this season by the Han and Ming dynasties. There are plenty of excellent tiles between them, so we might not see early action to see which claims the sole mandate of heaven, hoping for a similar rivalry between these two like the previous season's two Yuans. To the south are Bengal and Kokang. Both competitors are exciting in that one or the other tends to grow big and strong at the expense of the other. Both have room to expand, but do not be surprised if they settle closer to each other. Lonely Pandya lies on the southern tip of the Indian subcontinent. Pandya is guaranteed to have this little corner of the map as their own, but they will have to break out eventually and hope Afghanistan or Bengal do not trap them too early in the game. Back to Southeast Asia, we have Cambodia and the Philippines. The Philippines have a tall order ahead of them as there are naval powers like the Mori ready to snatch their islands away, and Cambodia is sure to take the inland tiles early. Below are Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and the long-awaited Yongu. No disguising the fact that Timor-Leste has the worst starting location this season, being in a small island close to two competitors with naval biases. Yongu has a large stretch of Australia to themselves, but Indonesia might decide to take some of their turf as soon as they dust off Timor-Leste. The Wiradjuri and the Maori round out Oceania. While both of these sieves on paper look like they should have a breeze of an early game to bulk up to superpower status, we have been left rather wanting by their performances. However, this is not a cause for concern, as we might just have a more exciting contest for the Pacific to look forward to. Now on to the Americas, we have the Kwak Waka Waka. Expect to have your Control C and Control B ready when writing about these lads. And the Cree. The Cree sport a fancy new icon and a slightly nerfed starting region due to stomping their way through the tests. The Kwak Waka Waka, on the other hand, have a mostly ocean view between mountains that might prove to contain them along the coast, Chile style. Below, we have the tight knit pack of the Modoc, the Mojave, the Arapaho, and the Comanche. One of these competitors is destined for greatness, but the tests did not favor any one of these sieves over the other, so expect plenty of meat grinders along rough terrain. On the northeast corner of the Americas is Vermont and Greenland. On paper, Vermont looks like the favored competitor, but Greenland has thus far surprised nearly everyone who has been keeping up on Discord with test previews. The seal hunters will terrorize these parts in short time. Across the empty Great Plains are the USA and the Seminole. There is a strong feeling of manifest destiny floating around these parts, and the Seminole are technically our Caribbean representative, so it might be quiet here for a bit while cities are settled. In a nice change to the Anahuac and Central America region, we have, well, uh, Central America. A conglomerate of all the Central American countries for their brief confederation, this is also our quirky atheist sieve, which gains bonuses by getting rid of believers. Below them are the long-awaited Muisca, who finally compete in the CBR to show us who have the best grip. In the Amazon basin, we have the Cayapo and Brazil. The Cayapo might be this season's Cuicaro analog, and Brazil our Brazil analog. We are not sure yet if either we are going to Brazil, or Brazil will once again come to us, but the time for Carnival is far away for now. And finally, we have the Inca, Chile, and Rio de la Plata. Totally not Argentina. In a sense, we have a very familiar South America, but with a twist. In particular, we have a switcheroo with Inca this time around as the naval-focused power, and Chile as the shy turtle, so throw out everything you remember of them previously from the show. The next turn button is clicked, and our first piece of action is Turkey immediately founding the religion of Sunni in Ankara. 
to be expected given their faith bonuses when units are promoted, and it is neat interaction given our setup providing the free starting units. The first new settlement is the city of Fez by the Tetuan. Tetuan should keep this up, being the first to many things, except maybe being the first eliminated. The Anglo-Norse, unfortunately, are ignoring the absolutely vacant Scandinavia and send their first settler towards the continent of it. Brandenburg has easy clay to gain if this will be the case. America moves southward along the coast and founds New York in a spot that the Seminole looked to have contested with their own settler. Washington says, first come, first serve, to Mikanopi, as the Seminole will have to look elsewhere. Egypt takes the Nile Delta as Chad moves into the desert to make some use of their bonuses. Han settles along the Yellow River, while their northern neighbors all send settlers in opposite directions. No forward settles in this region this time around. However, it is somewhat more cramped in South America. Given the tight space, I would not say this is forward settling per se, but Chile is already feeling the squeeze on turn four. Heartwarming to see Timor-Leste settle away in safety as Indonesia looks to Sumatra and the Yongu with the city of Milingimbi. Botswana and the Zulu would be expected to take a west-east divide of their domain, but the initial settlements might give a hint that this run will be a north-south partition between them. Kievan Rus and Lithuania settle their first cities as Vladimir has not even ventured their settler outside their city border. No forward settlements seems to be the play here, and these sieves might play nice with each other for now. Kokong moves into the mostly open southern China, and Bengal hopes to claim northern India before Pandya gets any ideas. North Korea ventures outside the peninsula as the Ainu also venture perfectly onto the continent. The Ainu may have the island to themselves, but an early foothold will do them more good. The Kwakwakawaku predictably stick to Cascadia for now, as the Cree inch in their direction. The Modoc and the Arapaho both look southward to keep their own distance from the Cree as well. Ireland has conquered the Isles. Job well done, lads. In all seriousness, it looks to be a comfortable first 100 turns for them if they take more of Albion, while the Anglo-Dutch eye Gaul instead. Yugoslavia and the Anglo-Norse have contained Brandenburg already in a joint effort. Whether it will work out for them remains to be seen. The Normans also feel advantages and make use of everyone having embarkation by settling Greece. Uganda makes the extra effort to deny Yemen, sending them a strong signal of intent through their first settlement. Yemen can still settle close by, but it will not be the quiet neighborhood they were hoping for. While most civs have settled already, the Comanche are going on quite a journey. Their settler crosses the length of the Great Plains and looks to give America some early competition. Safe settlements for Central America and the Muisca. Their respective domains are safe for now, so do not expect much of the camera glancing over here. The one sieve, with all the land at their disposal, decides to settle an adjacent mountain city in the Urals. It's a strong defensible settlement, I suppose, and having both sides of the Urals seems responsible, but I feel they should have been more bold. Chile does not pull off a Chile and goes into Patagonia. Credit to them, this is the best they can do to not be suffocated, though the city looks awfully vulnerable. The Wirajuri make inroads into the middle of their continent. The race to Uluru is on, even if neither one of these sieves know it yet. Unexpectedly, the Philippines forward settle Cambodia and send a defense force to fortify their claim on the mainland. It is quite the bold move, but it can come with a nice reward. Cambodia looks to settle northwards, though the settler may have been going for Cavite El Viejo's location. Having been blocked, Yemen looks to the Horn of Africa for better refuge. Looking at the map, it seems like the area in and around Oman would have been a better play, but with Aden, they can boss around the Red Sea in the future. 
This region of the map already looks full as new settlements are propped up in the lands between the four competitors. The Comanche still do not have a second city due to their rogue settler, but they still look like they have plenty of available settlement locations in the future. Our first great person highlight of the game comes courtesy of the birth of Heinz Goderian in the Chad domain. Lore does not look like it's on the menu for now, but Heinz tends to have a long shelf life. Roman von Ungern Sternberg appears in Assyria, offering Samaramat advice on how to unite all of Mesopotamia with just a ragtag group of lads he found lying about. Might be a tempting offer, since the Assyrian military looks non-existent, despite the early appearance of their sapper UU. Brandenburg took the settling affront seriously, and proceeds to quickly settle a second and third city to make sure more of their turf was not taken. While Brandenburg is already boxed in, their rivals seem content in keeping their outposts undefended. Shimazu Yoshihiro is welcomed by Cambodia to help unseat the Filipino interlopers. While the Philippines do not have a stellar garrison, it will take much more for Cambodia to threaten them. The Yongu have their fearsome Lipa Lipa UU scouting the archipelago for juicy settlement spots. This would be fine if it were not for having so much land to explore closer to home. A scattering of Lipa Lipas, though, would be more than enough to take Timor-Leste's cities off their hands. Oh my, the Comanche are on a vision quest of their own as their settler enters the Atlantic heading to the unknown. Typically, sieves are content settling close by, but this might just be the most extreme case of dissatisfaction for new pastures from a sieve yet. On screen is also Vermont's second city of Montpelier. The Comanche are in good company, it seems, as the Cocho also dumbfoundingly chose to settle their second city of Beshbalik right at the Permian's doorstep. Already, Cocho needed a stellar start to keep up, but they want to poke the bear and choose a tundra city when anywhere else in between would have been enough. Central America chose for their pantheon belief Arboreal Communion, which goes splendidly with all of the forest tiles surrounding them. The sieve that should not be founding a religion might just have a wealth of faith from tiles soon. Baybars is born in the Cree domain as they begin to bulk up. It does not look like a third settlement is on the way as they invest into caravans instead. The Gok Turks found the religion of Tengraism and have a settler ready to go. Kilwa settles Zanzibar not far from its real-life location in the direction of Uganda, and the Zulu likewise settle in their direction. Kilwa is not particularly known for their cheeses, but they pick the pantheon belief of blessed be the cheesemakers as they hope to pick up some bonuses for the almost no pastures to be found there. The Arapaho chose the pantheon belief of checks notes nationalism animals well, what seems to have occurred is that the sequel command for adding the spirit ideology looks for the word spirit and replaces it with nationalism when certain return to power modules are active, so this belief's text was caught up in that. But it is nice to think that the Arapaho have instead proclaimed that all animals in their domain are state property instead. The sieve with the nearly all open land picks the pantheon belief of open sky to complement their view of the cosmos. It will be a good bonus for the abundant plain tiles waiting for their settlers to come by. Timor-Leste with the big play. They choose the pantheon belief of God of the Sea, which gives them a sizable boost to their production woes. They might not be so hopeless after all. While most religions are settle bubbling up, Sunni is already enhanced. Turkey might be content playing the religion game for now, as they build up a military and have no settler out exploring. Kocho picks the pantheon belief of desert folklore, which complements their starting location well. Too bad they barely have any claimed desert tiles presently. The Wirajuri again settle closer in the direction of the Yongu. This is quite the statement, as they could have picked any of the dozen free locations around them 
but instead are going to play bold. Fair play to them if it works out. Vermont picks the Pantheon belief of Earth Mother as they hope to bolster up their capital city. A modest, if unexciting, choice. The first wonder of the game goes to Ireland, with the Gobekli Tepe being built in Dublin. Gobekli Tepe provides a base three faith per turn, and each source of stone and marble worked by Dublin will provide plus four faith, up from plus two the previous season. I should post the rebalanced wonders info on the sub soon. The Comanche are not far behind and grab for themselves Stonehenge, which provides the nice five faith per turn and the start of accumulating great engineer points. Seems that playing tall is their future in this game. The Kayapo choose the Pantheon belief of Sacred Faith, which provides them extra faith from jungle tiles, and they already get jungle bonuses. Stacking up is not bad, and we should see a strong faith output from them very soon. The Anglo-Dutch pick the very niche pantheon belief of Sacred Groves, which provides a huge faith boost for the nearly unknown marsh tiles. The swamp people were the only ones to make use of this well, so glad they picked this belief up. Vladimir picks the pantheon belief of Goddess of Festivals, as they hope to get some nice plantation bonuses. Certainly nothing to feel festive about for now, though. The Gok Turks settle a third city as Maurice of Nassau enlists with North Korea in preparation for any future campaigns. Central America makes the upgrade to found the religion of Catholicism. The one Civ that might not need to found a religion did, so we'll see how the interplay with their bonuses goes once their uniques come online in the mid-game, if they make it that far. The Inca established the first government of the game, courtesy of building Sargon's palace. They pick a monarchy to enshrine Tupac Yupanqui as their most excellent monarch. In a sad arrangement for those looking forward to early conflict in South America, Chile and Rio de la Plata come together in friendship. The arrangement seems highly beneficial to Chile, which can expand safely for now in the southern cone without worry. Kievan Rus lives up to their cultural legacy by building the Great Library. It is a nice early game to tech up against their neighbors, plus it looks lovely on the south side of Kiev. The Anglo-Dutch found the religion of Lutheranism in The Hague. Not much religious competition in this region, but they really need to get to building up a military. Timor-Leste founds Arianism on the back of a good religious start thanks to their pantheon. The first war of the game comes, and it is between Kocho and Han. Han is the aggressor as a sizable army descends upon Karakoja. It is not looking good at all for Kocho. We bring the first episode of the season to a close with a shot of the crowding Western North America. The Arapaho have seized more bison as part of the national inventory as the Cree finally look to expand. We'll catch everyone back here on CBR.TV next week this episode was a bit lengthier than what we should expect moving forward, given the initial intros, so expect faster reads this season. If you would like to narrate an episode, be sure to sign up on the sub. Thank you all for coming. Once again, I am Doc Ito. Have a good night and a pleasant tomorrow.